price of eggs are down from a year ago, but the cost of health care is up. Finding the best high-yield saving account can help your money grow more rapidly, but finding the extra cash to make that happen can be difficult. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this month's edition of Rural America Live with AARP. I'm Christina Loren. Paying off debt. Getting your savings back on track can be a challenge, particularly in a tight economy. That's why our guests, our friends from AARP, are here tonight to answer your questions. And they have some very helpful tips to help you take the right steps to secure a long financial future. And you at home are a big part of the show. You could actually be a winner tonight just by joining the conversation. Our question of the month is, do you have a tip for reducing debt and building savings? And AARP has a new giveaway this year. It's a high quality carry all tote. Five lucky on air callers will be the winners tonight. And it looks just like this. I don't know that that picture does it justice that you see on your screen. Let me show you right here just how nice this tote is. Pick up the phone, join our conversation. It could be yours. We're wasting no time in taking your calls tonight. Give us a call 877-283-7570. As a friendly reminder, you don't need to be a member of AARP or over the age of 50 to win, but you can only win one time each calendar year. If you're a winner tonight, AARP, a volunteer, a kind volunteer, will call you back using the number that you called from. That's going to happen in the next few days. So you want to be nice when you get that call. And good luck to you. If you're a past winner, you haven't received your cooler yet, be sure to return their call and provide your shipping address. The best part about it, this is heavy duty. This is high quality. But AARP will cover all of the shipping costs for you. And if you're not a lucky on-air winner tonight, you still have a chance. With AARP's Second Chance Sweepstakes, you can visit aarp.org slash aarp live or scan the QR code on your screen to enter. An additional carry-all tote will be given away each month and the winner will be announced during next month's program. Rules do apply. You can only win one time in a calendar year. We will announce February second chance winner later in tonight's show. There's that QR code again. Our phone lines are also open. Give us a call tonight, 877-283-7570. Join the conversation. We are ready to take your calls right now. We welcome our guests tonight, both repeat fan favorites. First up, it's Greg Marshallton, director for AARP Vermont. And we welcome Chris Farrell, economic journalist and author back to the show. It's always great to have you both with us. We begin tonight with some startling data. According to the Pew Charitable Trust, nearly 51% of Americans, 51% of Americans worry that they'll run out of money once they stop earning a paycheck and two thirds wish that they had started saving for retirement earlier. Greg, why do you think people aren't saving for retirement earlier in their career? Is it a lack of opportunities to save? Well, there's a lot going on here. Chris and I will discuss that as we move forward tonight. But look, 57 million Americans don't have access to a retirement plan through the workplace. So a traditional pension, for example, or a 401k. Uh, and that's really where people get retirement savings in this country right now. So this is a particularly acute issue for folks that work in small businesses, of which there are hundreds of thousands of across the country. So this is a real significant issue. Um, there is some good news. Um, in roughly almost 20 states now, uh, an issue that ARP has been working on with our state offices across the country is trying to establish through state governments a plan um, for people to be able to save through the workplace. So uh, we sort of lovingly call it the well, call it work and save. But what it does is it, it allows the state to help uh, uh, set up with employers and uh, employees uh, a system to have, like you and I do, or Chris and I do, have some amount of dollars deducted from their paycheck uh, every week, every other week, every month, however they get paid, and put um, into what is basically like an IRA. So if those are available to you, we strongly encourage you to, to consider those, um, because the earlier you begin to prepare for this, um, the better your retirement's going to be. So there is some good news, but again, as I said earlier, we have 57 million people in this country um, that don't have access to a workplace wow. retirement plan. And, um, 
and we've got to do better. Yeah, we absolutely do. I mean, Chris, as an economic journalist, what concerns you most about that figure? Oh, I mean, that is the most disturbing figure when you think about our retirement savings system, right? And so many people just don't participate. And the, the, the evidence is overwhelming. If you have a retirement savings plan at work or you're uh, participating in one of these state-sponsored retirement savings plans, you have some savings. But if you don't, you don't have savings. And here's the thing. People don't have savings because you know, life is expensive. Life is hard. You lose your job. You have medical expenses. You're doing some caregiving. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons why people don't have savings. It's not that they're going to the mall and they can't resist just spending on that T-shirt. No, their kids are really expensive. Anybody who has kids can know. They are really <laughs> expensive, right? So there are very good reasons why people have not saved. And, you know, frankly, our financial system is very complex. There's a lot of complexity to this whole area of retirement planning, retirement savings. And I also think that that sort of puts a dampener or is, is a barrier to more participation. Yeah, you know, and it's tough as well. You wonder how many people are, are thinking that Social Security is going to be everything that they need mm -hmm. when they reach the age to start collecting. Um, obviously, that's something we're going to talk about tonight. There's many things that you have to consider, and, and that's why we want you to join in on this conversation. What factors are you considering? Are you saving already if you're not of retirement age? If not, what's keeping you from doing so? And, and we just want to hear from you tonight. This is a really great conversation to have. We know that credit card debt has been surging in this country. Some people even find it hard to start saving because it can be so overwhelming. So, Chris, how do we get started? What would you suggest? Okay, the first thing is don't despair, right? It's really easy to get overwhelmed and you feel like I'm not saving, I have too much debt. Don't despair. And particularly if you're nearing <clears throat> those are tra traditional retirement years, you're, you're hitting your you know, late 40s, in your 50s, early 60s, and you're just thinking, I don't have hardly anything there. There's still a lot that you can do. And you can, uh, you know, one of the things that I always recommend for people, because it, it is complicated, automate your savings. You know, technology, this is where technology is good. We gotta have a conversation where technology is This is where technology is good. Tell your credit union, your bank, your community bank that on the 20th of the month, the 15th of the month, you want $5 to go into savings. You want $10 to go into savings. Whatever is the amount of money that works for you. And it's automatic. You never have to think about it again. Why is it that people who work for uh, a company or organization that offers a 401k, 403b, why do they have savings? Because it's automatic. Once, once you're in, and now typically you are automatically enrolled in the plan and you have to make an effort to get out of it. So once you're in the plan, every month, a little bit of money comes out of your paycheck, goes to this retirement savings. So tap into how can I automate my savings as much as possible? And you don't have to worry about getting penalized as if you were taking out of your 401k or <laughs> What you don't want to do <laughs> is right. if you can, I mean, that money, it's good that you can tap into it as an emergency that is really, truly an emergency. But if you can avoid it, avoid it. Try to set it and forget it. That's right. And therefore, it'll be there when you need it. Oh, pretirement. This, this is a term we're going to be hearing a lot more. <laughs> Tell me more about pretirement, Greg. Well, um, at ARP, we're becoming fond of calling uh, uh, this new phase of uh, pretirement. Um, and again, it's probably not a phrase that most people are familiar with, but if you're going to watch this program tonight, we're going to make you a little bit more uh, familiar <laughs> with it. Um, it's really a time... Uh, to change, uh, to look at changing your financial future and think of it as preparing the nest egg so that when you're ready to retire, you're giving yourself the best possible chance moving forward. So um, we're not calling it, pre, it's not pre-retirement anymore, it's pre-tirement. And again, it's a little bit about taking a step back and thinking to yourself, this time is coming, what are the things I gotta do uh, to make this work? Almost reduces the stigma that, that comes with That's retirement right. as well. Right. So yeah, we get to enjoy that stigma a little earlier on. Enjoy with me, everybody. <laughs> Pretirement. This is such an important conversation to have tonight because after all, we work so hard and you wanna have that time in your life where you don't have to work, you don't have to worry though. If you're on a fixed income, you don't have any financial concerns because you worked so hard. That's the time of your life where you get to reap the benefits.
Pretirement is important for that matter. Stay with us. We're going to give away carry-all totes to five lucky on-air callers on the other side of this break. We want that to be you. 877-283-7570 is the number to call and join our conversation. We'll be right back with more Rural America Live with AARP. We have some fantastic tips, ways to save you money that you may not even think about. They're so easy. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Hi. I'm your retirement fear. But don't be scared. You're still in pretirement. Pretirement? Does that mean I have more time to plan? Precisely. Here, this is pretirement.org. Huh. Retirement savings options? <laughs> Potential tax breaks? Yep. Boo. Oh, I could build up savings for my side hustle. This isn't scary. I'm doing it. You got this. Visit thisispretirement.org for free resources to help you customize your action plan. Pretirement, Greg said it. You're going to know all about it before this show is done. Welcome back to Rural America Live with AARP. How can you kill your debt and save more money? That's what we're talking about tonight. And it is a tough question, an individualized question for each of us. But we're sharing tips to help you do just that. And we want to hear from you. What are your cost saving tips? Maybe you're not eating out as often. Maybe you've got some grocery saving tips to share with us. Whatever the case, we want to hear from you. And you could be a winner tonight. AARP has a new giveaway. Five lucky on-air callers will take home a carry-all tote. It'll actually be sent to your home. Shipping covered. You could be a winner. 877-283-7570. And if you're not a winner, if you don't get on air tonight, well, you've got a second chance to do so with AARP's Second Chance Sweepstakes. All you have to do is visit aarp.org slash AARP Live or scan the QR code on your screen to enter. One tote all will be given away each month with the winner announced during next month's program. And we're going to announce last month's winner a little bit later on in the show joining us once again state director for aarp vermont greg marshallden and economic journalist and author chris farrell is with us tonight chris how are the 40 somethings and 50 somethings doing when it comes to retirement i know that we always look at this data and it helps us gauge what could happen in the future how are they doing right now so this is the generation where the 401k the 403B, where you have retirement savings plans, they really, that is their retirement savings. They don't have pensions the way that the older baby boomers did, for example. So there's a lot of concern about this generation as they age because they are at greater risk to what is the stock market doing? What is the bond market doing? But they are doing better at their age in terms of savings. They're doing better than the boomers were. And the reason is for a lot of boomers, this was new right in the workplace. And early on, places didn't insist that their workers join it. There was a very slow rollout on the education side. I mean, now there has been genuine progress. So if you look at that generation, they do have more, but there's a great deal of concern. They don't have enough. There aren't pensions for those who are in the private sector, for, by and large. And there are just much greater risk because they're more vulnerable to what happens to the stock market. You know, the boomers really did it right. We have a lot to learn, the younger generations, from what the boomers have done right. And so I just tip my hat. We know how hard the boomers have worked. And now you get to enjoy that. Many of you are enjoying the fruits of your labor. And we're trying to learn from you. But yeah, that's that's scary to think that we don't have the pensions. We, we don't have the ways set up, the financial means that our parents did, that our grandparents did. So we have to think about this. Let's find out what Llewellyn from Iowa has on her mind tonight. Thanks for joining us. You are a winner tonight, Llewellyn. Congratulations. Go right ahead. Thank you. And my comment was to list your bills and how much you owe each one each month and start with the lowest one. And if you can double it, uh, do so. 
And then when that bill is paid off, you just add it to the next up bill and pay double on that. I also tried to teach my kids that when you have a credit card and say 20% is the amount you pay an unpaid uh, premiums each month, that 20 cents is 20 cents out of every dollar that you don't actually have spending uh, ability with. Yeah, so he's really hit on something that's really important. I mean, this is why the standard advice is, look, you don't want to use your credit card to live above your means. You, you want to be able to pay off your credit card at the end of the month. And we do certain things where it just makes sense to use a credit card. You're going on vacation, you're booking a hotel, you're booking an airplane flight. There's lots of protections there that you get by using your credit card. But we're talking about the, he's talking to his kids, right? About sort of your everyday expenditures. Credit card's convenient, it's safe, it's in your wallet, but you want that discipline of paying it off at the end of the month because he's right, whether it's 20% or 18%, whatever the rate of interest, it's a very high rate of interest. I mean, put it this way. We're in an environment right now where savers are getting paid better than they have for a long time. And a good saver is getting 5%. Wow. 5%. And, and quickly to Chris's yep. earlier point, with technology, you can actually set up the auto pay. So you can good make point. sure that you are paying your credit card off every month. Um, and as Chris said, you know, it's if you let that go and you're credit cards at 15, 18, or 20% interest, it's going to hurt after a while. But you can use technology to set that up, have that auto pay done so you're paying the full amount every month and not uh, getting those interest charges. Wow. And saving. I mean, if it's something that, that you've been putting off, if, if you're saving at 5%, I mean, that's huge. 3% used to be good, but right. to hit 5% now, that's a, that's an incentive to, to continue saving or to put more maybe in that savings account. We want to hear from you tonight. What are your tips right now? How are you dealing with this high inflationary environment that we've been living with? John in California, let us know. What's on your mind tonight? Thanks for joining us, sir. Yes. My tip was to uh, keep a journal with you at all times and then write down every, everything you spend for a month and then analyze where you spend all your money and you'll find out you probably wasted a lot of money or bought things you nearly didn't need. Like, for instance, I don't buy uh, sodas out. I'll buy them at a store where they're a lot cheaper, and then I'll pack them in a little ice chest and keep them in my truck. <laughs> Just simple things like that. But it really adds up at the end of the month if you sit there and look and see how much money you've wasted that you could apply to your credit card or your savings account, which I just mostly put it into savings. And it's worked real well for me. Cool tip. It's a very cool tip. And I just have to say, there is something, there's a lot of research that says if you use cash, you're pulling it out and you're using cash, you're much more conscious of your money than when you use a credit card. I think what John hit on is when, you know, it's an old technology, you know, you have a pen or a pencil and you have a notebook, but you're writing out everything that you're spending the money on. And there's something I think about the way our brains works. Now, obviously, if, you've, if, if you're used to technology and you wanna type it in or you want, however you wanna do it, that's fine. But I really do like this writing it out. It just, you kind of remember it more, you're more conscious of it. And you, you are aware, as he said, it just makes you aware of what are you spending and actually how frequently you're spending and what you're spending your money on. Yeah, you know, I remember writing checks and, and the feeling of, of ripping that check out. Yes, and then exactly. It over. Uh, yes, There's an yes. attachment to that to that money when yep. you're ripping it out. So interesting, interesting, the psychology. Thank you for that call, John. We appreciate it. That leaves a line open for you. We'd love to hear from you tonight, and you could be a winner. 877-283-7570. Carry all totes. These are fantastic prizes. Just for joining the conversation. George from Ohio joins us and he is a winner. Thanks for joining us, George. Congratulations, sir. Go right ahead. Yes, um, I have a comment. Uh, I have uh, not a lot of savings. I do have some gold and silver. However, uh, my house is paid for and I have a lot of uh, assets that are pretty good assets. 
how much do you really need to retire? I am 75 years old, and I'm a retired pilot. So there is a vast literature trying to answer George's question. And I'm not evading George's question. It's highly individual. What you end up with are rules of thumb, guidelines. Here's what is suggested. Uh, for example, you know, they, they, you, know you, you should have 10 times your income when you're hitting uh, the retirement age in terms of savings. And typically you're talking about your 401k uh, and, your, and your other savings accounts. Um, but there's also, there's a, a rule, well, you need about 80%. You're going to spend about 80% of what you spent while you're working. And so you need to have that money. But the thing is, what turns out is, let's say you might travel a lot. Uh, in the beginning. And so the 80% rule might not work for the first couple of years of what you're thinking about. But the way George framed it is he's in a position where he doesn't have debt. I'm a, he said he paid off his mortgage. So I'm assuming there's no other debt and he has assets. So he's in a position where he is financially secure. And then he's got some questions about how to maybe generate some income by selling some gold, selling some silver. Maybe there's some other assets. So there's a lot of guidelines out there. And I think these guidelines are good to get you thinking about how am I doing? But, and as you get closer to that retirement age, these calculations become a lot more practical. I mean, look, when you're 30 years old, how much are you gonna be spending monthly when you're 70? He's, uh, George is 75, 75. That's an unreal, you, you can't. But you're 60 years old, you probably can make a pretty realistic, you kind of know what you're going to be spending, right? And you can make some realistic projections. So the projections are important. This is a big part of uh, retirement savings. But use the guidelines that are out there as guidelines and then adjust them to your household circumstances. Yeah. Great. I, I, don't have much, I, mean, I don't have much to add to that, but I think, it, it, it is what Chris said. It is, the answer could be different for everybody. Um, but going back to where we were, you know, sort of in the last segment, like the sooner you start preparing, the sooner you start putting that $5 away when you're a 21 year old worker, maybe you bump that to $25, you know, when you're 25 years old, the sooner that starts to happen, the more prepared you're gonna be. And then it's going to allow for that flexibility in retirement to, to what Chris said. If you want to travel, if you want to do some things, you'll be able to figure that out much easier. So start as soon as possible or start right now. Pre-tirement. 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 <laughs> That's right. That leaves a line open for you tonight. 877-283-7570 is the number to call. Lori joins us now from North Carolina. Thanks for joining us, Lori. Go right ahead. Hi. Um... I was curious about how much it costs to uh, prepare for long-term care, and how do I save up for that kind of money? There is no easy answer when it comes to long-term care. We do not have, we use the term long-term care system. We do not have a long-term care system in this country. Uh, largely, long-term care is largely provided by family extended family, close friends, sort of the informal care market. And then once you start getting into professional care, um, you know, it gets very, very expensive very quickly. The long-term care insurance market that used to be fairly large is now dramatically shrunk. There aren't that many players in that market. So this is one of the reasons why saving for retirement, saving for your elder years becomes so important. I think one of the things we recommend is as you age, who's going to be taking care of you? As you age, who's, who's going to be responsible for your finances? Have you done your health care directive? What about your power of attorney if you're starting to have, you know, some issues where you're slowing down and you may need some help there? And so uh, there's no simple answer in that, but you really want to reach out into your community and you really want to gather as much information as possible. You know, are you going to live in your own home? Well, if you are going to live in your own home, one, does it have a mortgage? Let's get rid of that mortgage. Uh, secondly, is it the kind of place where you can age in that home? Does it have, um, you know, does it have steep stairs, for example? So start thinking ahead of time where, as you get older, your knees aren't as good as they used to be. So you have to start thinking about those things. Um, and then, you know, I'm a, I, I am an internal optimist. I had this, this optimistic side of me that, you know, with the aging of the population, there's going to be growing pressure 
in order to improve our long-term care insurance market, in order to pay the long-term care workers better, but at the same time make it affordable to families. But that's going to take time. That's not going to happen overnight. So it's really, you have to plan ahead and think about where are you going to live, who is going to be your caregivers, who's going to be responsible, and then how do you make it as easy as possible for them? And then as you, um, you know, you may end up on Medicaid, you know, learning, you know, may have to spend down your assets. So it takes time to figure that out. And I'm, uh, I'm glad she called in and said that because, again, you want to plan, you want to think, and you want to be thoughtful to the people that care about you. And you also want to make sure you're taken care of. I feel like um, this is something where AARP could, could really make a difference in, in fighting for long-term care in we, Washington, D.C. Well, we do, yeah. and not just Washington, D.C., but state capitals across the country. As I mean, Chris has eloquently said, I, mean, I really couldn't say it much better, this is a significant, huge problem in our country. And it really is up to the individual and their families to figure this out because we don't have, as Chris said, a long-term care system. Other industrialized countries around the world do have systems in place. We do not happen to have one. Um, so those discussions with your sons and daughters and your aunts and uncles and cousins and people that are going to be a part of your caregiving environment are really important to happen much sooner. And Chris made a really important point about advanced health care directives and powers of attorney. Get those in place as soon as possible because that can make a really big difference moving forward. And then finally, I would just say, um, if you're frustrated, um, and call your lawmakers and tell them that you're frustrated because we've got to figure out a way to get through this. And one final comment, a lot of people believe that Medicare provides is kind of like a long-term care plan. It does not. It provides about 90 days of acute care in a nursing home, and that's it. So don't mix, don't think that Medicare includes a long-term care benefit because it really doesn't. No, there's nothing long-term right. about 90 days. Not much. My and I just right, because I had mentioned Med Medicaid, and That's the only reason I mentioned Medicaid is Medicaid is the public option for long-term care, but you have to spend down your assets. So essentially, you have to reach impoverishment, and then you go into Medicaid. Right, and just one more quick thing on that. You spend down all your assets, and in most states, not every state, but in most states, that also means you're are required to go to a nursing home. Um, so you may have to spend down your assets, but you may not need to be in a nursing home, right? You could still be at home, but most states don't allow that to happen. So there's a lot of complicated stuff here. Um, so again, uh, call your elected officials and tell them to get on this because um, there are solutions here. But as Chris said, they're not. it's going to take some time and they're not going to happen overnight. Excellent, though. Really, really helpful information there. We're going to go back to the phones where Jerry joins us now from Alabama, our next winner. Congratulations to you, Jerry. Go right ahead. Thanks. Uh, I was uh, wondering, uh, what age would you tell people to stop trying to save? Because, uh, you know, just like you say, you kind of answered my question right there about, you know, like the nursing homes, you know, you have, you know, they'll take the access, you know, you have to spend it. Well, what age would you tell people that, you know, you got enough, uh, you can live instead of keep on, you know, trying to save. Good question. It's a very, it's a very <laughs> good question because uh, really a big part of it is when do you stop working? And, you know, it used to be that was a fairly simple, I mean, Chris, what are you talking about? Stop working. We're talking about re retirement, right? You know, and obviously quite, that, that's what Jerry's talking about. But there's been a really rethinking that many people are, are working well into their traditional retirement years, not necessarily full time, not a career, but, you know, picking up some money and you may want to save a little bit of that money. And I would, you know, say that right now, you know, we have an economy with a very low unemployment rate. And one definition of economy is a good economy is when employers are looking for workers. Bad economy is when workers are looking for employers. So right now, employers are looking for workers. So. If you're able to work, uh, maybe remotely or do a part time or do some flexible work, you know, go ahead, pick up some money that allows you to have some savings. Typically, when people are living off their savings, it's when they really truly cannot work any longer. And then they're on their Social Security, they're on Medicare, and then they're drawing down whatever they saved over the years. You know, it's interesting. Um, I feel like the next generation, I've heard this anecdotally. Um, the next generation, the younger generations, don't want to work as hard as the baby boomers. So I think that some employers might be more inclined to go 
with a baby boomer than somebody from, from Gen Y or one of these newer generations. Well, I don't necessarily know if that's true or not, but, I, but, but to Chris's point, if you are, when you get older, and you're gonna have, you may have more flexibility uh, as a worker, which means you might be able to say, I'm just looking to augment my income here. So at 15 or 18 hours a week, I could go to uh, a, a coffee bar and you know pour coffee and espresso, or I could work in an apartment store, I could, and just trying to bring in some some extra income. Um, and we need employers to see the value of older workers, yes. and that is also complicated right now. But yeah. older workers tend to be much more flexible, and of course they have this breadth of a huge amount of experience behind them and a lot to offer. That's true. I mean, I listen to a lot of conservative talk radio, and uh, and it's something that's brought up quite a bit. The older generation willing to work, they work hard, yeah. they're great with customer service. These are assets, so if you've maybe considered yeah. going back to the workplace, you will be valued. And I do say, you know, I think, I think the younger generations get a bad rap. So and I, I, you know, they're better educated than we are. And so, and they have a longer life expectancy than we do. And so the fact of the matter is, I think they are actually going to work longer just because they're better educated and they're going to live longer. But there may be more variation in their careers, not work so hard, yeah. take some time off. And I think that balance may be a lot healthier, both physically and mentally. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Many were born into wealth as well. And so there's a lot to consider. Dee in Colorado joins us now. What's on your mind tonight, Dee? Well, when I was a working girl, in about the last 10 years before I quit, every time I got a raise, I put that in a savings account, just an automatic withdrawal. So every month it added up, and that's how I kind of did my, uh, my retirement plan. It just added on very well. Well, all I can do is applaud. Yeah. I mean, it's just, absolutely. that's absolutely one of the smartest things you can do. <laughs> Congratulations for having the discipline. But everybody listening to this, take away her point. That is just a foolproof, good method to emulate. Okay. I love that. And, and we can all learn from your example. Thank you for that call. That leaves a line open for you. You could still be a winner tonight. 877-283-7570. Charlie joins us now from North Carolina. Congratulations, sir. You are a winner. Go right ahead. Yes, I have a, <clears throat> I had a question. I'm going to be 65 in September. And is it better for me to uh, wait till my full term, 67 and 10 months, I believe it was, or go ahead and draw it 65? You're talking uh, about Social Security. Have a state retirement also. Yeah. So here's how I like to think about it that you get the maximum benefit if you wait till you're age 70. You can file as early as 62, and age 65. And I, you know, my feeling is it doesn't matter in one sense. You know your circumstances. You may, the best thing to do is go for 70. The best thing may be to go to 62, depending on your circumstances. But you start at 70, and then you work your way down. Your health is deteriorating. That may say, then I should file at 65. Uh, you may be doing caregiving responsibilities. You're no longer earning an income. You may need Social Security. Uh, there's a family history that suggests you kind of, or you have bad health. You know, here I'm going to have to. But start at age 70 and then just make what is the best for me in my circumstances. Start at 70. It's great that you can go all the way down to 62 because there are people who need to file at 62. But the longer you wait, the better that Social Security benefit is for the rest of your life. That's the key. This is, this is an annuity you cannot outlive. Greg? Uh, again, Chris, I think nailed, nailed it perfectly. We would recommend the same thing. Start at 70 and work yourself backwards. But Chris's point really needs to be understood by viewers tonight. This is, everyone has individual circumstances here. And like you said, if you're in deteriorating health, you've got a caregiving situation, um, these things are going to factor in to whether you're going to maybe draw down at 65, 67, or 62. Um, and again, um, you know, being able to make those decisions for yourself 
and including your loved ones, including your family, so you're really understanding your surroundings, what's going on, will make that a better decision. So there isn't one simple answer for everybody. That's a really important point he's making, which is, you know, we, make, we, we, we talk about these as individuals, but most of us were part of a, a community or family, extended family or close friends. Involve them in your conversations. Don't go on this alone. You know, talk to the people around you because if their family is going to affect their lives too. So you do want to have those conversations. Absolutely. That's why this conversation right exactly. now is so important. And we still have time to hear from you tonight. 877-283-7570 is the number to call. Stay with us. On the other side of the break, we're going to announce our second chance winner from February. Plus, we still have carry all totes to give away. Again, that number 877-283-7570. Hopefully you're enjoying this conversation as much as I am tonight, learning so much. We'd love to hear from you though. We'll be right back. More calls on the other side of this break. Rural America Live with AARP continues. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We still have a carry all to give away. We're gonna go right to the phones in just a moment. But first I wanna announce our second chance winner from February. The winner is Jericho, Vermont. Congratulations to you since you provided your information when you scan the QR code. Your tote, get this, technology, it's probably on its way already. You can tell Dennis I'll drive it to him if he doesn't get it in a few days. <laughs> Thank you. Dennis L. of Jericho, Vermont. Congratulations to you. And again, AARP will cover the shipping. We still have carry all to give away to a lucky on-air caller tonight. One of these could be yours as well. So 877-283-7570 is the number to call. Tim from Kentucky joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Tim. Go right ahead. Good evening. Uh, thanks for taking my call. The, the thing that I really want to impress on any young listeners is when you are still working and your employer has a 401k program, participate that in that program to the maximum amount and uh, you, you'll never be sorry that you did. That'll really pay great benefits when you retire. Well, uh, he's right. And if, if it does feel like a strain, you at least want to participate up to the match. Most employers offer a match. So that's part of your compensation. You don't want to leave any of that on the table. So if you're starting out and you're younger and you're just going, oh, this is really hard, go to you take full maximum amount of the match. Now, uh, off was it uh, Louise, I think, um, you get a promotion. Now you get a little more money. You increase your contributions into the 401k. So he's absolutely right. A lot of companies now over three to five years, well, usually it's five years, will automatically increase contributions by their employees till they get to the max in about a five-year period. They've kind of figured out that that doesn't put such a big strain on their employees. So you can use that as a mantra, but take advantage of that match. You know, here's the thing. Warren Buffett, you've heard the name, the legendary investor. You are outperforming Warren Buffett year after year with that match. Wow. It's really simple. Never leave free money like lying around <laughs> on the table when your employer is saying, we're going to give this to you if you just put this much in. Don't ever, ever leave that on the table. And as the caller smartly said, start right away. Yeah, that was yeah. excellent. And I love how you, you really wrapped a nice bow around it. It's part of your compensation. That's right. This it is. is part of your compensation. You, you, you have Absolutely. earned that. This is, this is not your employer being, you know, this free money or whatever. You have earned this. I love that. Okay, Pamela joins us from Iowa. Thanks for joining us. Go right ahead. Yes, good evening. I'm calling with three tips. The first one would be your checking, your savings account can be started from your odd dollars over your hundreds and your paycheck. So any odd dollars that you get, 20, 30, 40, whatever the numbers are over your, your paycheck, $100, start a savings account with that with a refund from your state refund if you get one of those, or whatever your banking uh, uh, requires. Your, if it's a, a bank, sometimes they charge 200 Some uh, credit union might only charge 25 So use that as your base to get a savings account started, and then those odd dollars over the hundreds. The other thing is, is if when you're doing odd 
spending and your paycheck to paycheck at the gas station for donuts or whatever when you when you go in and and pick you know something up off the shelf those odd dollars add those up between paydays and make yourself an allowance you can either make it as a cash allowance to yourself or to make it into a um an account at the bank so that you can use a card to use it. And then every payday, what's ever left over in your allowance, use that as a um, out and save that back. And eventually you will have, um, amazingly, how much money you'll have left from payday to payday in the year for that purpose. And then make a spreadsheet. And when you're doing your spreadsheet, make it uh, whatever columns. You can get them at the office supply store for an 18-column spreadsheet. And those will um, eventually, you can do the first columns for the things that you have to pay taxes on, and then the other columns to record your utilities and the other things that you have to pay out. Make that a spreadsheet on your computer, but use the spreadsheet um, items to keep you track on track month to month. So those are my three tips, and good luck, everybody. It works perfectly. The savings programs work perfectly. I did it, and I had four savings accounts at one point. So thank you for your time. Good evening. Mm-hmm. So I'll pluck out two, two things. Um, one, she's really right. If you, you know, look, you go to the gas station, you want a donut, fine. But use cash. And actually give yourself an amount of cash that you're going to use every week. And again, it's once you're really conscious of that spending when you use cash and how much it's costing you. And it's a good discipline to have. So... Um, you know, we're all human. There are certain things you want to do, but, you know, acknowledge it. And cash is a way of controlling that spending. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we use the, you know, the, 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 the budget word, right? But really all you're doing, it's information. What's coming in and where's your money going out? And a couple of callers have made that theme, you know, about, well, where, what are you actually spending your money on? And that's all a budget does. It lets you know, where's my money going? And then you can make some decisions about, um, well, I have too much credit card debt, so let's go through my spending and I'm going to attack the credit card debt. Or let's go through my spending. I, I, sh- I don't want to be spending my money here, but I want to be spending it elsewhere because, you know, what I really want to do is go on a nice vacation this year. So I'm going to create a savings account for my vacation. So it's information that then allows you to actually make realistic choices and it allows you to plan in a realistic sense. I added one more thing to that. I liked her idea of uh, her tip one, which is putting a little bit in a savings account. This goes back to something earlier that Chris said. So that add up. So one day you might have a big car repair. You might need, you know, the roof repaired on your house. Then you're not going into your 401k, which you will pay uh, healthily on in taxes. And you've got that little next egg uh, that you're building. But then it can be super helpful for some more kind of a high price thing that you need, might need to pay off against something like a roof or a car or something like that. So that tip one I liked a lot too. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. It, it all starts though with, with heightening your awareness where your dollars are right. going and then your accountability. It's, it's the number one thing. Yeah. And you know, for reasons I don't really understand, it has some sort of, it seems like it's a bad word, it's a bad thing to do. No, it's just really information that allows you to make choices. and. You know, it's important to make choices. It's important to be conscious of where you're spending your, where your money because we all want our money to, in some sense to support our values and what we value and that our money is going toward the things that we think is important. A shelter, a food, transportation, but also maybe, you know, meeting with friends in a restaurant and our health. I mean, there's all kinds of good things, but in order to make your choices, you have to know where you are. But we want to hold our government <clears throat> accountable for every red cent. But then when it comes well. to our own pocketbooks, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe we could be taking a closer look. Donna from Wyoming joins us. Thank you for joining us, Donna. Congratulations. You are a winner. Go right ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, one of our savings tips is to save the smaller of our two Social Security checks. And that helps us have a nest egg to cover inflation that happens, and especially that proved the point in the last few years. Um, We've been retired for about eight years, and so um, that's helpful, and it it covers also emergencies if we have something come up. And additionally, we've been saving 
in a separate account um, the difference between the tax rate in 2016 and the tax rate in 2017. So we've accumulated quite a nest egg for us in that time period. Same kind of thing for emergencies or if we want to splurge or buy a car. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> and that's. No, I, th I think it's one wonderful what, what, what you're doing. And it can even be broad. I mean, you're, you're using Social Security checks, right? But you can also just think about a two income household and really being conscious about, you know, where, where the savings is going. So, I mean, I applaud what you're doing. And. I think it's smart and it's to recognize that, you know, emergencies happen. You'd mentioned, you know, the car may, may be going or something like the that. Roof, yeah. The roof. I mean, these things happen. We don't know when, in, you know, inflation is moderating, but inflation could spike up again at some point, somewhere down the future, you know, in the future, who knows when. But it's just so, you know, throughout our lives, we're always trying to balance what it is we're doing versus being having some resilience on the downside. Right. And so she's come up with a way where they have some resilience as things come along. So whether you're earning a paycheck or it's Social Security, you know, you always, you're, that mindset that is in your 20s, it's in your 30s, guess what? It's in your 60s and it's your 70s. What you spend money on changes and some of the ratios change and the sources of income can change. But don't you think it's kind of you're always balancing out resilience versus, you know, doing things that you want to be doing. Yeah, I'll let her think, that, that, that's absolutely right. And again, an earlier point that Chris made with the last caller, budgets are about choices, right? And so that's why it's important to write that stuff down and sort of stay with it because you want to make good choices and then you can be accountable to yourself, to your spouse, to your community about the choices that you make. Yeah, you're literally building resilience. That's right. Yes. I love that. That's you, right. We have a rare opportunity, a, a couple extra moments here. And um, Chris, you're an economic journalist. We just hit a, another record today. Stock market's doing fantastic. Any key indicators or anything that you're watching for down the road as we are considering our finances going forward, our 401ks and, and how we are allocating our resources? Anything that we should be watching for? Yes. So... The way that I look at the markets is you can't control the markets. Who knows where the market will be tomorrow? Who knows where it'll be a year from now? Who knows where it'll be three years from now? So focus on what you can control. What you can control is through your budgeting and your spending and developing your skills so that you can earn more money and that you have greater um, job security. And that is throughout a lifetime, as because as we mentioned earlier, so many people are working longer. You want to keep developing those skills. It's also just good for your mental health. It's good for your physical health to stay engaged. So I always want you to focus on building that resilience into your household, the things that you can control. And one of the things you can control, and it's just, you know, this pre-tirement, right? That's pre-tirement. One of the things you can control is savings. How much, okay, may depend on your uh, income, may depend on your circumstances, but you can save. That's something you control. Where the market's going to be, I have no idea, but you can save. And so focus on the basics, keeping debt down. In fact, no debt except for your mortgage, uh, if you're younger, if you can do that. Uh, have savings, uh, have retirement savings, have your savings for your, your vacation, you know, have your savings because you know your car is going to break down in three years. And you can pretty, most of us can pretty much figure out this is getting toward the end, right? Uh, it's going to take it in for some repairs the next couple of times, but then that's it. Start, you know, so have your auto savings uh, replacement account. So these are the things you want to be focusing on, what you can control. I love that. And speaking of what we can control, we can't control March Madness, but we can control accessing March bargains. So let's talk about that. Let's do that. <laughs> March bargains? Yeah. I believe that's for you to talk yeah, about. Yeah, well, don't let, uh, <laughs> well, don't let uh, retirement surprise you, <coughs> right? That's really the most important thing. Um, so in these March bargains, we've got them. Vacuum cleaners, there's beauty <laughs> products. I believe that winter sports gear, I know we've had sort of an odd winter this year. Uh, travel supplies, things like luggage, televisions, 
Uh, these are bargains uh, that are available, and everybody loves a bargain. I mean, so we want to make sure about that. Who you know, doesn't love a bargain? Right. Um, so yeah. Don't let retirement surprise you either. That's right. We definitely don't want it to surprise you. So let's do a few things there too. You want to set up your. This is a lot of stuff we talked about tonight. Save for retirement. Uh, invest in your health. This is a particularly important one. Pay attention to your health because that goes a long way to enjoying your retirement. Pursue your passions. Do the things you care about. Be with the people that you love. Be the people you want to be with. Nurture those relationships. And maintain options for work. Chris just talked about that. It's a critical thing to do. Uh, stay sharp with the skills you've got and develop new ones. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, financial pressure, if you are somebody who's dealing with debt, it, it can be heavy. It can weigh a lot. Yeah. Um, just the stress of that is something that you probably talk about on your show. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, whenever you, you survey people, I mean, there's sort of student loan debt obviously weighs on a lot of younger people. And then it's everybody. It's just part of, you know, we're part of the society is credit card debt. And I think... I think I've known one person in my life that didn't have credit card debt. I mean, most people get it under control, but I only know one person that never had any credit card debt. Uh, but most of us fall into a period of time where we, 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 look, we just spend too much. We end up with the credit card debt. It's really easy to do, and it's not easy to get out of debt. It just takes time. There is no, no mag magic bullet. It takes time, and it's much easier to get into it. And then once you've gone through that experience, what you really want to take away is get out of debt and then don't go back in debt that way again. That's the key, right? You don't want to end up on a roller coaster because that's just frustrating. It's not good for your mental health. If, if you don't do anything about it, though, that feeling's not going to get any better. And one of the first ways, like you talk about, is just information and looking at the figures and then, and then making a plan and just yeah. that empowering feeling of knowing that you're doing something about it, it can take a huge load off. And so that's something that, that I know yeah. a lot of people are dealing with credit card debt out there who can hear us tonight. You got to start somewhere. And do, just very briefly, in terms of ways to attack credit card debt, do we have time for that? We do. Or, we do. So I call it the Spock method and the McCoy method. Now, if you're a Star Trek fan, you'll understand. So the Spock method is really rational. You list your credit card debts with the highest interest rate first, and you attack that credit card. And then in your other credit cards, you just pay the minimum. And then when you get rid of that credit card, then you go to the next highest rate credit card and you go and you just pay the minimum on the other one, go through that. So that's the, that method will save you the most in interest. But, you know, how many of us are really that rational, all right? <laughs> so we're emotional creatures and we like to be rewarded. So there's another method where you put your smallest debt first. That's the one you're gonna attack. And then you put your next smallest, and then you put your next, your, 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 your largest one at the bottom. You attack that small one first, and, guess, and you just pay the minimums on the others. Guess what happens? You pay it off. Hallelujah. I did it. I got rid of that debt. It's a reinforcement. And you go after the next one. So if you're more rational, attack the high interest rate first. If you want that sort of emotional reward, you know, you've got something on the refrigerator that you're just going to reinforce this. And just go after the smallest debt first, forget about what interest rate it is, and then work your way through it. But both methods will work. One thing at a time. We've got a few moments left. Final thoughts? Uh, it's tax season. Just in case anybody have got their taxes done, ARP's tax aid program, a monumentally wonderful thing that we offer to people all across the country. If you haven't done your taxes, Go to aarp.org slash tax aid and find a site. We'll help you out. All right. Always love having you on, Greg. Thank you for coming back. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate you so much, Chris. Thank you for joining us. Wishing you and your family a beautifully blessed evening.